do you know who the very best basketball free thrower of all time is? I bet you don't. It isn't Shaquille O'Neal. I know that. But you know as well as I do that f uh, shooting uh, free throws often makes the difference between winning ba basketball games and not. Well, the very best shot for free throws was a man, is a man, by the name of Tom Amberry. Have you ever heard of him? No, I'm sure not. In 1993, uh, judges from the Guinness Book of World Records went to Tom's home, and he started early in the morning shooting free shots as they witnessed what In the end, <clears throat> they had to stop, not because Tom had missed a basket, but because it was getting dark and they were using a hoop that was outside. Tom shot 2,750 free shots in a row and didn't miss one. His name went into the Guinness Brook of world records has the very best shot, the very best man who's ever shot that many free throws. Uh, I want to tell you how he did it. The NBA and other basketball organizations around the world got interested in Tom and thought maybe he could help them become better at their game. Turns out Tom was a basketball player in college but when he left college, he, became, he went to medical school and became a doctor. When he retired as a doctor at the age of 65, he decided that he needed to do something to stay in shape. And he always loved basketball. And so he started in the morning, every morning, to go out and practice his shots. He gets up every morning and goes out and he shoots 600 baskets. On a good day, he makes every single one. On a bad day, he might miss as many as four. He does this day after day after day until he did this amazing performance for the Guinness Book of World Records. So when he was asked what, what was the most important thing that helped him to be this good uh, basketball shooter, he said something very interesting. He said, it is the power of being focused, of taking your time and your energy and concentration all that you can give for that time that you are practicing and perfecting your skill. Now, I just want you to know that that's a principle of good living. Uh, it's even in the Doctrine and Covenants in section four, where it says that we should serve with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. It's the same thing, the power of being focused that can lead us to do amazing things. I am so excited for the competition tomorrow, and I just want to wish you all good luck, and we'll be there to celebrate the results. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, thank you, now I can go home fulfilled. This is a great ideas conference and competition. So I want to talk for a minute about how to get great ideas. I saw some great ideas today. We loved getting together with you and meeting some of you. I wish we'd been able to have all of you at our table. I want you to know we love you. And we're proud of you. And we're grateful to be here with you. When I was getting ready to write my dissertation for my PhD, 
I came up with what I thought was a great idea, and I took it to my faculty advisor, and he read it through, and he said, yes, if you do that, you will earn your PhD. The only problem is your dissertation will be dull as dishwater. I thought, criminy, I'm not gonna spend this much time and work this hard to end up with something that's dull as dishwater. So I threw that away. Ended up with a much more interesting topic that actually ended up taking me to my first job and ultimately my career. What a favor he did to me by being brutally honest. So if some of you tomorrow don't get quite the accolades you had hoped for, just remember it can't possibly be as bad as mine. Nobody's going to tell you your project is dull as dishwater because they aren't. But if you don't win, don't worry about it. Learn from it, grow from it, and the next one will be superb. Now it's interesting. If there is a God in heaven, and there is, and if he loves you, and he does, and if he cares about your life, and he does, that means he cares about where you go and what you do, which means if you approach it the right way, you actually have the right for inspiration for the ideas that you generate that lead to projects that lead to, to not only graduating from BYU-Hawaii, but ultimately your career. That is to say, the best great ideas, in my judgment, are inspired ideas. So the question is, how do you get an inspired idea? Thankfully, the Lord has told us in the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 8485 says, treasure up, meaning you gather as much information as you possibly can from as many different sources as you can possibly find. And then once you have all of that information, then in DNC 9 it says study out. So you do your best job thinking about it, analyzing it, talking with others, and having them help you do the same. And then finally, when you think you have it right, you ask in prayer for confirmation. And if it is right, you will get that confirmation. If I could make a humble suggestion, I would suggest you never submit a great idea until you have that confirmation. Because if you have that confirmation, you can go forward with great confidence and faith. Now, the first part you can't skip. It would be nice if we said to ourselves, well, the Lord loves me. He's going to take care of me. All I have to do is sit, wait here, and he's, a lightning bolt is going to come and tell me what to do. It doesn't work that way. He's made it very clear about that. He says, you have to do all the work first. It means typically you have to start with a great question. Let me tell you a story that you think has nothing to do with what you're doing, and I suggest it has everything to do with what you're doing. One of the newspapers we had when I was CEO at Times Mirror was <clears throat> a paper called The Baltimore Sun. We had a creative, wonderful editor there. A man named Louis Farrakhan had said publicly, there is no such thing as slavery in Africa. Most editors would approach that question by assigning a reporter who would go out and interview people, and they'd find some people who said, yes, there is, and they'd find other people who say, no, there is not, and they'd do a perfectly balanced article leading to no conclusion. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. This editor asked a very different question. His question was, can I buy a slave? He then sent an African-American uh, journalist from downtown Baltimore and one of our best foreign correspondents to the Sudan, and we bought two slaves. It was one of the most heart-wrenching series I have ever read. These two slaves had been stolen from their blind mother. The African-American journalist talked about how the feelings he had inside as he was on an airplane realizing his assignment was to go buy another human being one of the weirdest expense reports I've ever seen. One slave, $500, ooh. We bought those two slaves, we returned them to their blind mother and permanently settled the question, is there slavery in Africa? Yes, there is. Sadly, there's also slavery in the United States. I don't know if you know that, but there's a constant problem with slavery literally around the world. We found that out because we asked a different question. 
when you think about a great idea, it has to start actually with a great question. And for those of you who in are in business, it, that question is not, what can I do to earn a living? The question has to do with, where is a need out there that I can help satisfy? And how can I do that in a more effective way? Having asked the question, you then want to generate as much information as you can from as many sources as you possibly can. When I was at General Mills, <coughs> I'm still a shareholder, by the way, so eat your cereal. When I was at General Mills, <laughs> we had a man who asked a very interesting question. He said, how much does it cost us when we do a changeover on one of our packaged food lines? Turned out that a changeover took about three hours as we moved from one product to another. He added up all the times we did that throughout the year and how much that cost us, and it turned out to be a very large amount of money. So he said to, him, to his staff, our current performance is three hours per changeover. Your new standard is to be 10 minutes. They said, we don't know how to do that. He said, I don't either. You go figure it out. Well, sometime later, I asked him how it was going. He said, well, on one line, we now have it down to 11 minutes. I said, my goodness, how did you do it? He said, well, we went to the NASCAR pit stops. You ever seen these things on a, on a race? The cars come in, the wheels go off, the gas goes in, the wheels go back on, and it's out of there in a matter of seconds. He said, we took a video picture of everything they did, brought that back and tried to figure out how that applied to a changeover on our line, and we're now down to 11 minutes on that line. I was bragging about that to a CEO of another company who made big engines and things like that, and I thought, this is just the best thing ever. He said, well, that's interesting. Our changeover time was 10 hours. I said, really, what is it now? He said, 10 minutes. I said, how do you do it? He said, we went to the NASCAR pit stop, took a video, watched the cars come in, the cars go out. We're now down to 10 minutes, every line in every factory. The point is, they didn't look at the traditional. They looked at something very different from what they were doing and learned something from that. One of the beauties about being at BYU Hawaii is you have people here from all over the world. I hope every day, every place you are, you just keep asking questions of the people that sit next to you. What do they do? What do their parents do? What kind of life do they have? What are you studying? How does that work? You will find as you gather information from the most unlikely sources it suddenly triggers an idea in your mind that allows you to move forward more effectively. So as you gather all of this information, something interesting starts to happen. The spirit starts to tell you, find out more about that. And you find out more about that, and the spirit says, yeah, that's a good thing, find out more about that. And as you begin to gather more and more information, the spirit starts to tell you, this is a really good direction to go. That means when you kneel down to pray and ask for confirmation, nine times out of 10, you already know the answer because the Spirit has been helping you along the way. If you have a great inspired idea, everything else will tend to fall into place. Great ideas attract great people. It's easy to recruit people to a great idea. It's really hard to recruit people to a dumb idea. It's impossible to recruit people to a dishwater idea, I found out. It's easy to get capital for great ideas. It's easy to get mentors for great ideas. In other words, the name of this conference is the central piece of what we have to do to figure out how to move forward. I was thrilled at the ideas I saw in that room today. Will they all work equally well? I doubt it. Are some of them absolutely terrific? Yes. Do some of them need more work? Yes. But it's very clear to me that you're working at it the right way. And <clears throat> whether it's this one or the next one, you're going to start to come up with great ideas that will not only change your lives, but will change the lives of others. That's why we're so grateful to be here. We love what the faculty and the staff do here. They're devoted to you. They'll do anything to help you. We love them. We're grateful for them. And oh my goodness, do we love you. I wish you had any idea how deep into our hearts you go and how grateful we are.
to have you a part of our lives. I know that that God in heaven is real. And I know he loves you and wants to help you in every righteous endeavor of your lives. I promise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>